Good evening and welcome, Professor Troy Farrell, Head of School of Mathematical Sciences here at QUT, AMSI staff that are with us tonight, uh, our program sponsors, other distinguished guests, academic staff, members of the public and students. Uh, my name is Professor Ian Turner and I'm the event director for the Winter School um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone here for the public lecture that's being held tonight. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, we are holding the 15th AMC Winter School here at QUT over the first two weeks of July, where we have around 50 higher degree research students actively attending the Winter School and learning from our lecturers that have come all around the world and across the nation to teach them. Uh, it's a tradition of the event that we hold the public lecture on the Monday of week two, and that's what we're doing tonight. Uh, now let me acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. The QUT community acknowledges that our university stands on Aboriginal lands, the country of the Turrbal and Yugara people, lands that were never ceded. We pay our respects to the elders, past, present and emerging, and thank them for their wisdom, their forbearance and their spirit of sharing. We respectfully recognise the role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play within the university and in the wider community and we celebrate that the lands on which we study and work have always been places of learning, research and engagement. Just some brief housekeeping before we kick off. In the unlikely event of an emergency, the exits of the theatre are clearly marked. We should exit through the main entrance doors that you came in through, or one of the signed fire exits. And the assembly area is just outside on the left on the lawned area, just opposite the old government house. Uh, the toilets are just a straight across in the P block, on level four uh, and I just want to take the opportunity now to thank all of our industry sponsors for the winter school and that's the Australian Government and Department of Education, the Australian Mathematical Sciences Institute, that's AMSI, BHP Building Foundation, the Queensland Cyber Infrastructure Foundation Limited, QUT, the University of Queensland, the ARC Centre of Excellence for Mathematical and Statistical Frontiers, that's M uh, ASIMS. So now it's a great pleasure to introduce Chloe Pierce from, from AMSI, who is the Research and Higher Education Manager, who's going to talk a little bit about the AMSI programs. Over to you. Good evening. Is that on? Yeah. Good evening. On behalf of the Australian Mathematical Sciences Institute, I welcome you also to this evening's public lecture. Um, as Ian said, my name is Chloe Pierce and I'm the Research and Higher Education Manager at AMSI. So tonight's lecture forms part of AMSI's annual partnerships and outreach programs. So before we begin, um, tonight I'd firstly like to thank um, our university host this year, QUT. Uh, this winter school has been under construction for under uh, 12 months. Uh, lots of logistics, lots of uh, academic programs and um, lots of event management and, as you know, applications and registrations. So uh, firstly, I'd also like to thank Professor Troy Farrell for the ongoing support of your department. And I'd also like to thank Professor Ian Turner, our event director, for all his work on all the academic programs. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the event staff for tonight, so um, from QUT, Andre, and also Amanda in Troy's department, and also Anna from AMSI, who you may have met last week. Secondly, I'd like to recognise our ongoing partnership with Boeing Australia. Uh, Boeing and AMSI have had many joint projects over the years, including many careers events uh, and also a lot of YouTube videos um, on the mathematics behind uh, aircraft design. And so if you haven't had a look at the AMSI YouTube channel, I encourage you after this uh, event to hop online and see what else um, Boeing has on offer that we've worked with previously. Um, thank you very much um, for coming this evening and um, we look forward to your talk. Uh, finally, I'd like to recognise our major funding partner, and that's the Department of Education and Training. Uh, this winter school is one of five major programs uh, with funding from both AMSI and the Department of Education and Training. It forms part of a wider joint project uh, with DET called uh, Securing Australia's Mathematical Workforce. This research uh, training event um, is offered to mathematics students across the country 
and it aims to increase access to academic programs, networking and career opportunities for students. Uh, it also aims to raise the profile of mathematics at the host institution where we host all our events. This project uh, is particularly aimed at those students studying honours, masters and PhDs in mathematics and also in cognate disciplines such as engineering, computer science and biology. This project could not operate unless it was national and I would also like to acknowledge the number of interstate students here this evening who wouldn't be out here without uh, the scholarships offered uh, for travel accommodation and also for childcare. Finally, after this year's winter school, there will be more opportunities available to participate in AMC events. Uh, we have a bioinformatics conference coming up the first week of December with uh, University of Sydney, uh, located in New South Wales. Uh, our AMC summer school is annual and will be held in January 2020 at La Trobe University in Victoria. And for the younger students, the second and third years, we have a vacation research scholarships program. Some of you may have participated in previously. And this is an opportunity for students to engage in six weeks uh, mathematical research projects and then attend a conference to present their work. All these events are sponsored by AMSI and the Department of Education and Training. Finally, I thank you to everyone um, in the audience for your support so far, and I hope you enjoy this, this evening's public lecture. Thanks very much, Chloe. Okay, so I'd now uh, like to introduce our speakers from Boeing Research and Technology, and that's Michael Elford, Yongpeng Zhang, and Andrew Steffen. Michael Elford currently leads the Numerical Simulation in Materials and Manufacturing Group at Boeing. He's completed a Bachelor of Mechanical and Space Engineering and a Master of Philosophy in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Queensland. Michael has worked for Boeing Defence Australia since 2006, beginning as a structures engineer and then senior structures engineer on the F-111 sustainment program. His current role is senior researcher in the area of advanced manufacturing and maintenance. Dr. Yongpeng Zhang completed a Bachelor of Engineering and a PhD degree from the University of Queensland, and he's currently a postdoctoral research fellow within the School of Mechanical and Mining Engineering at UQ, working on, advanced, on an advanced Queensland Innovation Partnership project related to incremental sheet forming. His research interests are in applied mathematics, numerical methods, material modelling and optimisation. Dr Andrew Steffen studied mathematics, physics and statistics at the University of Sydney and graduated with a PhD in applied mathematics. His research area was in the development of high-speed solvers for simulating magneto-hydrodynamic flow in spherical geometries. Andrew joined Boeing in 2016 and is currently developing advanced software for simulating manufacturing processes in sheet metal. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our Boeing speakers. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Ian, for that warm welcome, and thank you also uh, to yourself and to um, the wonderful staff at AMSI for uh, giving us the opportunity to present the public lecture tonight. So the lecture tonight will be on numerical simulation of sheet metal manufacturing processes, and uh, I wanted to discuss a little bit about the outline of the talk. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time, uh, about 10 minutes, to look at where we sit, uh, my team, the Numerical Simulation in Materials and Manufacturing group uh, within the broader uh, Boeing in Australia and Boeing as a whole. I'm then going to move on to look at why we might want to uh, perform simulation of uh, manufacturing process and, uh, in particular, um, some examples of sheet metal manufacturing uh, I'm then going to move on to how we go about validating the results that we get from the solver, and then I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Andrew Steffen, who will then give a much more in-depth uh, look at the mathematics of the finite element and isogeometric solvers that our team has developed. And then finally, uh, Dr. Yongpeng Zhang uh, will look at an introduction to computational materials modelling. Okay. 
I'd like to kick off, though, with a showcase of some of the wonderful products that Boeing uh, have developed and are currently in use. Hopefully this, oh, sorry. There we go. All second stage tanks now pressurized. 30 seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T-minus 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, uh, well that was an exciting video, but an, a really exciting fact is that uh, Boeing's biggest footprint outside of the US is actually here in Australia. And so uh, this slide, which I do acknowledge is a couple of years out of date, um, but the facts should be um, reasonably correct, um, is that we have uh, roughly 3,000 direct employees in, in Boeing within Australia, um, and we have 9,300 uh, jobs supported indirectly. Some of the figures that are relevant to uh, tonight's talk are perhaps the uh, $47 million investment in research and development in Australia. So that is through uh, Phantom Works and uh, through Boeing Research and Technology, both here and in Melbourne, as well as our university and CSIRO collaborators. Okay, now I want to give a bit of an overview of what Boeing Research and Technology does. Um, here I have a slide that's talking about uh, what we do in Brisbane, but I'll briefly mention that in our Melbourne office, um, they're really focused on composite structures and architectures, as well as uh, robotics, amongst other things. Uh, in Brisbane, it's a little bit of a different mix. Um, so we have a team whose um, focus is on autonomous systems, so they're interested in uh, detect and avoid and uh, collision avoidance systems um, in order to uh, harbor the safe um, interaction of UAVs in and amongst um, manned aerial vehicles. We also have a fairly big team uh, looking at extended reality. So they have a particular focus on training solutions. So they look at virtual and augmented reality uh, for um, 737 pilot training as well as uh, the CST-100 uh, Starliner um, procedural training. We have uh, the Aviation Ecosystem Modeling Group uh, whose role is to look at synthetic environments, so sort of event-based simulation. And uh, one of their big success stories is the weather server, which is able to pull up um, the weather events historically from different times and dates and uh, put that right into virtual uh, sort of gaming type environments um, for the event-based simulation that they are interested in solving. We also have an advanced web systems group. So they're interested in the next generation of enterprise tools uh, leveraging web-based or new web-based applications. Um, they've had a lot of success uh, in the area of um, real-time connectivity tools, and that's been used actually in the US for some launch events. And last but certainly not least is the focus of tonight's talk, uh, which is um, my group, the Numerical Simulation in Materials and Manufacturing Group. So we're really interested in uh, developing our own um, tools um, based uh, or written for GPU, so computers, uh, computing done on graphics cards, and uh, we're interested in simulating materials and manufacturing processes, primarily with finite element, um, but also with isogeometric analysis. Okay, um, just a quick note on some of the outreach programs that Boeing has. Um, so um, Boeing Defence Australia here in Brisbane um, likes to engage students around the 
uh, or, or beyond um, in order to offer them internships. And uh, that's about three months of real world problem solving where they get exposed to, to leadership. I am uh, told by the human resources that uh, now is a, a great time for this slide because the applications are actually currently open and I think they'll be open for about a week longer. Um, for those that are sort of uh, postgraduate, um, we have uh, top up scholarships with a number of universities. And so uh, this is a great program, I think. And uh, in fact, one of the things that we're presenting tonight about isogeometric analysis has pretty much been done um, completely by uh, one of the students that we've had in this program, um, uh, Yarrow Hockenen. OK, so now to the, our team, Numerical Simulation and Materials and Manufacturing. Um, who are we? Well, uh, internally, we're pretty small. Um, there's myself and Dr. Andrew Steffen, um, both of which you'll hear talking tonight. But we, um, we rely heavily on uh, leverage with our university partners. And uh, one example of that is the grant that we currently have, the Advanced Queensland Innovation Partnership, which allows us to have uh, Dr. Yongpeng Zhang working uh, for us and in with us uh, full time. So uh, we have a collaborative uh, relationship and a common space where we can do work together. Um, we're all really passionate about solving problems uh, with numerics and so, um, been a great opportunity to talk tonight because I think it fits in really well with the conference. Um, we like, uh, as I mentioned previously, doing our simulations on high-end gaming cards, um, which comes with the added bonus that our laptops have flashing rainbow colors, which is always great. Um, we enjoy having arguments all the time, <laughs> constructive arguments. And uh, actually, we have this uh, fantastic whiteboard um, that we're able to challenge each other on and derive things. And uh, it's just a fantastic space in there to be able to, uh, to be a team. Oh, yes. And our longest argument so far has been three months. All right. And now I want to talk a little bit about incremental sheet forming. And so um, the advanced Queensland grant that we have has allowed us to explore this uh, process in particular. So incremental sheet forming has a few different variations. Um, so just going from the top here, we have single point incremental forming, or SPIF. And so that's when we have uh, a sheet that we clamp around the edge, and it's held fixed in, fixed in space. And we have a stylus tool. You can see that in, in red just there. Uh, it goes around along a path and forms the material without any dye underneath. Um, then now going to the bottom one, two point incremental forming. That's when we have a die that's made out of, uh, say, uh, MDF timber or plastic, and we're forming from the inside out over a die. And the frame can actually move down and has a slight downwards force um, during that process. There is a third process, uh, which is a little bit newer, called dual-sided incremental forming. So it requires a special machine. Um, it has a backing tool that supports the, the tool as it's forming. So this has been um, explored a little bit in a Department of Energy project in the US in which Boeing participated, uh, as well as Ford and Ingersoll. And so that resulted in a machine that's able to produce uh, parts using that process. But tonight, I'm going to focus on uh, the top and the bottom. OK, so hopefully this will allow us to uh, visualize a little bit what I've been talking about. So you can see the stylus tool is moving. And here, what we're looking at is two-point incremental sheet forming. So we're forming over a die. I'll just run that one more time. We're forming over a die. You can see some of the previous layers that have been produced there by the stylus tool. And that frame, that outer frame, will continue to move down. OK, a little bit more about the Advanced Queensland Innovation Partnership. So it's composed of three, th uh, three streams, um, and it's in collaboration with the University of Queensland and QMI Solutions. Uh, I head up uh, Stream 1, and so the focus of Stream 1 and also the focus of the talk tonight is the development of a rapid solver for incremental sheet forming, where we're targeting um, hugely improved efficiency over what's available commercially in terms of solvers for sheet metal forming. Um, in particular ISF, and also improve solver accuracy through better 
uh, material constitutive models. Different element types that can uh, capture behavior, particular behavior better. Um, now the other two streams I'm, I'm really not going to talk about, but I will mention them briefly. So in incremental sheet forming, uh, another area of research is to be forming parts progressively in multiple stages. And the reason for that is to have some control over the thinning um, by choosing the shapes that you're forming as intermediate shapes. Um, the third stream is feedback and control for incremental sheet forming. So looking at um, changing the tool path uh, very slightly during the actual forming uh, to have a, a final um, improvement over the accuracy and the thin out properties. Okay, and with that, I'd like to talk a little bit about the motivations for wanting to use numerical simulation uh, to explore uh, the manufacturing process prior to committing. Okay, so typically when we're looking at a part uh, that needs to be manufactured, and that, that might be a part that's going on a, a new aircraft or, or a part that is uh, just a repair part for an aircraft, uh, it's always going to have some requirements. And those requirements obviously has to have a strength requirement. It's also got to have a fatigue requirement so it can meet a number of uh, life cycles uh, in order uh, and without failing. But there's other considerations, economic considerations. So it needs to uh, be optimized for cost, of course, and it needs to have um, an acceptable process time, but also lead time. Uh, and with some of these processes, the lead time can be significant if we have to manufacture um, large dies for tooling. And so that, that's one advantage where incremental sheet forming can help. Uh, the dies are a lot are quicker to manufacture. Um, and there's the opportunity, of course, to save material and um, save on uh, energy by investigating and optimizing the manufacturing process prior to actually uh, committing to the tooling. Okay, so a quick word about some of the failure modes that we can see in sheet metal. And I will note here, these, these parts are purposely failed because they're actually being used for materials testing. Uh, however, so we can see uh, a few examples there of tearing of the material where the in-plane strain is, is simply too large to be supported by the sheet. Um, we can see when we have compressive strains where actually warping the material out of plane, so that's a wrinkling or buckling. And uh, you can also see here uh, an example of necking. So necking occurs prior to tearing where you've got uh, in plane, uh, sorry, a thinning strain rate that's much higher than the strain rate of the uh, in-plane material. Okay, what I'd like to show you here uh, in this slide is uh, where we've used our solver, um, which we call Flex, to simulate four different manufacturing processes um, for the same part geometry. And we're gonna have just a little bit of a look of some of the differences to the thinning uh, that we see from that. So the first one is hydroforming. And so hydroforming is the action of a sort of fluid, some sort of hydraulic fluid that's pushed into a cavity and the sheet is deformed against a fairly rigid die. Next, uh, oh, I should point out that the tooling is actually hidden in these simulations, so I apologize if that, that's a little bit confusing, but it uh, helps with the clarity. So the next uh, simulation is actually a deep drawing or uh, where we've got the uh, upper die that's actually moving down and deforming material into a nested lower die and squeezing it into place. And we can see these are reasonably similar in, in their profile with the thinning occurring just on those corners. Um, however, the minimum thinning here is just a little bit less than we see with the hydroforming. Next, the stretch forming process is, is quite straightforward. We're getting a sheet, fixing the frame, and pull it, pulling a very large load down onto it, and uh, we can form certain parts that way. However, for, for this part, probably rather predictably, we can see that we can't actually get the desired shape, uh, and the reason for that is pulling that sheet over is not going to work where we have concavities, large concavities in the part. So here this is a, a fail, this process, um, for reasons of uh, the deviation from the, the part geometry itself. Uh, as well as exhibiting quite a lot of thinning. 
And then finally, we have two-point incremental forming, which I've explained uh, in a previous slide. Again, the, the tooling's not shown, so if you can imagine a tool going over loop uh, in, in subsequent contours. And so what's interesting to note about this particular process is we have a very different thinning profile produced by this, and one that is far more sensitive to the wall angle. So uh, having a good simulation, an accurate simulation that's very rapid helps us assess uh, some of these differences and even optimize um, aspects of the manufacturing process. Okay, and just to put this in context one more time with a cl perhaps a clearer example, here I'm going to focus in on two-point incremental forming, uh, which is a, a mode of incremental sheet forming. So if we look at the top one here, this is the intended way the process is meant to operate, uh, which requires a, a sort of custom-made machine with a moving outer frame. It's able to have a light load to pull it down, and that effectively pulls the sheet out of the way of the tool as it's forming. Um, let's make one change to the solution of these partial differential equations. Let's change the boundary condition. Let's fix it instead of applying a load. Uh, what would that mean practically? Well, that would allow us to use an ordinary three-axis CNC machine to do the same process. So we can do a what-if with a great simulation tool. And so it starts to look okay, but there's a, a somewhat subtle effect that exaggerates over time, and that is it's actually forming a well because the material is not getting out of the way. So the amount of contact with the tool is actually increasing. And the thinning is exacerbated and the result is drastically different. So uh, this, this would tear um, previous to, to what we've seen here as a result. It would tear quite a bit before that. We're not actually simulating damage in this process so we can't see it. And so we can see what we're able to alter conditions uh, on the simulation that help us explore the parameter space a bit more. Okay, one last example here. Uh, single point incremental forming of a thin steel sheet still behaves very different from aluminium and other factors uh, which uh, Dr. Yong Peng Zhang will talk about a little later play a role. So here, just playing that again, we can see that it actually buckles. So as we're forming over it, the material pops back up uh, elastically, uh, making it uh, an unacceptable result. Okay, so why we built Flex? Um, there are existing sheet metal um, simulation engines out there. However, a few years ago, when we wanted to apply this to incremental sheet forming, we uh, knew from what we read in the literature and from trying this commercial software that it really wasn't feasible to be simulating uh, this kind of process. And that's because incremental sheet forming for large parts can take uh, an hour or, or even more to, to form a single part because this stylus is traveling for miles, literally miles as it forms it. And you can't sort of skip parts of that simulation because you have to resolve the detail of the tool interaction with the sheet metal at every step. And so, okay, we, we had a couple of options on the table. And one option is to say, perhaps reduce the physics a little and have some sort of semi-empirical representation. Um, or was there a way we we could get away with sort of having the FEA, but just having it faster. And so we, uh, somebody had told me about this new technology called CUDA, Compute Unified Device Architecture, built by NVIDIA that lets you access your graphics cards and kind of hijack it so that you can run scientific simulations on it. And so we started playing around uh, a few years ago and found that this is actually really effective. Uh, not always super easy to optimize, but easy to get at a result. And so here we are a few years later, and, and thanks as well to the, to the grant, we're in a position now where we have a few different variants of this solver. Um, one which we call classic, which is uh, thick, uh, thick shell um, BWC formulation. Um, that was our original attempt. Uh, then we got a bit more advanced, um, and particularly with uh, Dr. Andrew Steffen um, developing the solid shell. Um, and then uh, isogeometric analysis, as I mentioned previously, was developed by Yarrow Hocken. And, and all of this is supported by Dr. Yunpeng Zhang's work in uh, the computational materials models. Okay, and the bottom line of, of why we built this and, and where we're at at the moment, uh, this is a slide from uh, a conference talk we presented last year at the Numi Sheet uh, conference. Uh, we are actually 102 times the execution speed with our solver as compared to Abacus. 
uh, for the same element type. And so that, that's not 100%, that's 10,000%. So literally over 100 times the speed um, for, the, for the same problem using the same element type. Um, and that's really thanks in part to uh, some optimizations, but most importantly due to GPU computing. As I said, not necessarily easy and takes some dedicated optimization to really get it up to speed. And, and that's where Andrew has been getting his hands very dirty into pitch memory and all sorts of optimizations to, to get to that performance level. Uh, but it is possible to do. OK, and uh, now uh, section three, I'd like to talk briefly about validating results. So uh, we're in the fortunate position to be able to have a machine uh, located at our partner, the University of Queensland, where we can actually form uh, a part and compare that part uh, to the simulation results that we're getting. So here you can see a toolpath um, that we've um, cut. It's of a, a truncated icosahedron, so it's kind of a generic complex part that we chose for the purposes of validation. Now, uh, this is not a part, I should mention, that we would actually think it's acceptable to put on any sort of vehicle, we chose the single point incremental forming method because it actually has the most freedom uh, to deform and um, the, it's significantly out of tolerance when, when you compare it to the part for most geometries. So that, this is actually the most challenging um, process that we could try to simulate. So we have a 3D scanner available. Um, through the University of Queensland where we can scan the resulting shape and that white uh, mesh that you can see there is the result of the 3D scan of the formed part. We scan both sides and then we are able to register um, the, two, the two meshes together and estimate a thinning profile from that. And so here's what we see. Uh, this is a cut through of the part and so what we have is the, in the yellow dash lines, uh, we have a, uh, the actual geometry itself, the target geometry. Um, it's, it's important to note that's not what we're trying to match. So what we're trying to match is the red curve. And the red curve is a cut through of the actual scan profile. Um, so obviously, in, as I said, in this process, there's significant uh, deviation of the sheet from the actual um, geometry you're trying to form, particularly in this sort of bending zone near the top, um, and then we get closer down the bottom. The simulations, however, very closely reflect um, what we're seeing in the scan profile, except perhaps in a region just up to the top right. I'm not 100% sure what went on there, but all other regions seem to be matching really well. Thinning-wise, um, I think it's a, it's a pretty good news story as well, and uh, we can see that the different element types, so um, the BWC element type and Flex Classic and uh, Flex Isogeometric Analysis and the Solid Shell, they all converge. Uh, this is with a quite a fine mesh, uh, in fact, about 10 elements per stylus diameter. They all converge to um, pretty much the same result and they all uh, match pretty well with the experimental uh, thickness profile. And uh, it is certainly good as a numerical person to see all three different numerical solutions to a partial differential equation uh, give the same result because the sheet metal really doesn't care what numerical scheme you choose to form it with, um, so they should line up. All right, and this is my last slide. Um, so here we used a second method now to explore the, the thin out. We used a device called a Magnamic, which is produced by Olympus, I think. Um, there's a sort of ball bearing and a probe, and as the probe comes closer to the ball bearing, it uses the Hall effect to determine the precise distance between, or the precise gap between the ball bearing and the probe. Um, so we're able to, as long as your part isn't ferromagnetic, which is, this was an aluminium part, we're able to roll it over and actually um, take measurements across that profile. Um, I'm not a perfect operator, um, so there's a bit of deviation in, in what was measured. Uh, we did it six times and took the upper and lower bounds and they're the red dash lines that you can see. So we're comparing that now to our three thinning profiles for the different solvers uh, and we can see there's, there's pretty good agreement there as well. Okay, so I'm now going to hand it over to my colleague Dr. Andrew Steffen who will look, uh, will give an in-depth mathematical um, exploration of the 
finite element and isogeometric solvers. Thank you. All right. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Michael. Uh, I'm not exactly sure I'll say in depth. And for the most part, uh, a lot of this shouldn't come as a surprise to people that paid attention in Dr. Pastana's first lecture of the, uh, of the winter school. All right, so uh, of course, what we need to start with is our physical model. Uh, we're, of course, talking about moving material, so we have balance of linear and angular momentum. Uh, these are just the first two equations here. Uh, do note here that I've retained my full derivative, convective or material derivative, uh, which just means I'm considering my time derivative following the material. All this means in the end is that my mesh is going to deform with my material. Uh, I've got my conservation of mass. I'm actually not going to talk too much about that. I've got a material constitutive model, which at the moment is just going to be a black box. Uh, Jung Peng will talk a bit more to that. Uh, I've got my energy balance and boundary conditions, which I'm going to be very naughty and completely disregard for the moment, except to say uh, my boundary conditions are either I'm going to fix the velocity or I'm going to fix the force on different parts of the boundary. Uh, and just as an aside, for an incompressible Newtonian fluid, usually we just have this constitutive model. So just stick that back up into your balance of linear momentum and off you go. Ish. All right, so now onto the finite element method. So the basic idea here is to grab my balance of linear momentum, dot it with, a, uh, with an appropriate function from an appropriate space. Don't worry, I won't go into that. And integrate it over my, over my material domain, which is here denoted uh, omega, larger omega, hopefully. Uh, just here as an aside, I've just written A for dvdt acceleration. Uh, and I've made the simplification of applying an integration by parts along with a divergence theorem. Don't worry too much about that if you don't want to. It's just for the people that like following it. And then, as per usual, I approximate my, I approximate my functions by uh, finite sums of what I'm going to call here shape functions or basis functions. I'll usually say shape functions because that's what engineers like to call them, which are just my NIs here. And after you go through all that process, you end up just with a, linear, with a linear system of the form f equals ma, which is nice. Now, I'm going to be awful and give you this system in full. I'm going to do this for a couple of reasons. One is so I can sneakily introduce some additional notation. Uh, the first of which is I'm going to use these braces just for when I have a symmetric tensor. And I want to express that as the minimum number of independent variables. So for example, here, my d is my rate of deformation, which I defined on the previous slide, uh, which is a tensor, so it's got six independent variables. So I'm just going to represent that as a vector. Uh, let me see. And the other, bit of, the other bit of notation that'll come up a few times is this B matrix. And all that is is the matrix which takes me from my, let's say, element-wise uh, velocities into my rate of deformations. So all it is is just a matrix that contains derivatives of my shape functions. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, I just want you to look at these and sort of uh, get a feel for what sort of terms we actually have to integrate when we're trying to solve these equations. So uh, in particular, we got things that are, forms, uh, that are of the form of products of shape functions, products of derivatives of shape functions, shape functions integrated over surfaces. And that's, that's pretty much all I want to say about that. So that's the finite element in general, about as quick as you can possibly go. I apologize for leaving out all the important detail. Uh, when it now comes to actually saying we have different finite element methods, uh, especially in the context of uh, solving, let's say, solid mechanics sort of problems, the differences are going to be our, the, choice of shape, the choice of shape functions and how I choose to define my geometry. Uh, that is before I make an approximation. So I'm going to talk about the solid shell finite elements. Uh, these are one of the ones that we sort of work with a lot uh, in BR and TA. Uh, the basic idea is pretty straightforward. If you're used to brick elements, this shouldn't be a big jump to that. Uh, we just have a sheet where we assume that in the thickness direction, uh, we've got a much smaller dimension in the thickness direction than we do in our in-plane. Uh, we just discretize this into hexahedral elements. Uh, we're going to use the isoparametric mapping, which just means I'm going to map these into a 2 by 2 by 2 cube, uh, which just by the shape functions written here, these trilinear shape functions. And I'm going to evaluate all my integrals uh, by using numerical quadrature along the line xi equals eta equals naught. 
which are just the red dots shown here. All right, and that is pretty much it, I wish. All right, so the first question you might ask is, why on earth would you use uh, such low order quadrature in the xi eta direction, especially given the terms that I've just said we have to integrate? Uh, so we're just gonna consider a very simple example here where say I've got this little chunk of material. Uh, I've drawn in here a bunch of red lines which are gonna be material lines. So as the material deforms, these red lines are gonna move with the material. And I'm just gonna apply an equal moment to the two ends. All right, so the material's gonna deform like the blue and my finite element approximation is gonna deform like the black. Uh, what you notice here about the uh, material lines, the red lines which are attached to the actual material, so to the blue, is although they're no longer straight, they meet at right angles. And what this corresponds to is uh, no shear. So in this, actual, in this deformation, I've actually introduced no shear into my material. What happens if I was to use a gas quadrature in my finite element approximation? Well, here I've drawn in the material lines for my finite element, uh, and you'll see that at the quadrature points, they no longer meet at right angles, which means I have a shear. Uh, this effect is called shear locking, and what it does is it, means is it makes the element not as flexible as it should be. And this is actually a massive problem. If I was to just use this as it is, I'd get, depending on the type of deformation, let's say not great results. So we do what is done in this, way. it's just a standard method, it's just to stick our quadrature point at a point where this isn't actually a problem. So for example here, in the middle of the element. Now this is just one form of locking. Unfortunately, there are many forms of locking which depend on all sorts of things from my uh, elastic constitutive model to the shape of the element to the type of deformation Etc. Etc. The list goes on. Uh, in short, it just comes. It just comes about from the inability of my element to uh, accurately represent the mode of deformation which the element's actually undergoing. All right. So that kind of fixes locking, but unfortunately, in fixing locking, I've introduced a new problem by sticking my quadrature points where xi equals eta equals naught. Any form of, of non-rigid body deformation, i.e. one which should be straining the material, uh, which has a xi or an eta component, is now completely ignored by my constitutive model. Because remember that my constitutive model is evaluated at my quadrature points on the middle stack of the element. Uh, what this gives is an effect called hourglassing. So this means there are modes of deformation, actually I don't need to repeat that, there are modes of deformation uh, under which the element can deform. As I've given it so far, uh, you can write down six. You can actually show these quite simply, two for each of the x, y, z. I've drawn here the two for the x velocity. And what you should notice about these is unfortunately, they all conform to each other. So you can imagine that I can just keep sticking elements next to each other that actually deform in this same way. And uh, that kind of propagates through your mesh and you end up with this sort of, well, I can't, I can't describe it as anything but garbage as you, are, as you can see there. Uh, the reason this is called hourglassing is because they make little hourglasses. Well, that's what I like to think anyway. Unfortunately, we still have to fix locking associated with our through thickness quadrature, and this is gonna mean that my analysis of the hourglass modes is completely destroyed, so I got it, so unfortunately I have to fix the locking before I fix the hourglassing. So we're just gonna talk about the outer plane strains. I don't wanna go through this too much. I've kinda of got the mathy version for the people that wanna follow and I've got the easy listening version as well. Uh, so the basic idea here is to, uh, there are many methods different people use and the ones, well the one that we're gonna start with is actually just called an assumed natural strain method. And the idea here is knowing what the modes of deformation are that lock, we can change the way that we actually calculate our strains in order to avoid the modes of locking. So the basic idea here is to start out with our covariance strain, just looks like that, and to reinterpolate, first evaluate it at the uh, edge points of these planes, then reinterpolate it into the interior of our element using these shape functions. It just looks like this. Uh, that's for those that are interested. For those that aren't really, the basic idea is just change how we calculate our strains so that we don't get locking. Of course, like I said, we're not done. There's more, there, there's locking associated with the missing zeta component of our covariant strains. So what do we do? Well, we just jam one back in. But of course, we have to plug that back through our, our model 
and find a consist consistency condition, which after we go through all the math on the weak formulation, just looks like this. Uh, yep, the easy listening version, just jam in an additional bit of an additional strain component and constrain it. So uh, to convince you guys that this was all worthwhile, shown here are two simulations are uh, supposed to be the same problem where the top two images are without the locking control and the bottom two images are with the locking control. The main thing to note here is just how the top one is kind of really bulbous and convex, especially at the top, and the bottom one's nice and concave. Obviously, they can't both be right. And uh, when we actually go and form the part, we can see we actually do get a concave top. So that's to convince you that that was all worthwhile. Hopefully that does. Now we can get on to the hourglassing. So uh, because I have to calculate all my constitutive model in my Cartesian frame, I've got to transform everything into the Cartesian frame. Uh, in doing this, I'm able to separate out the polynomial components of the strain that I do and don't see at my uh, integration points. And the basic idea here is just to say, well, since I know exactly what my hourglass strains are, I can calculate the hourglass forces directly. Uh, unfortunately, I, don't, I can't use the same constitutive model because I don't want to do the whole constitutive update. And also, because if I was to use the same constitutive model, I'd just end up reintroducing the locking. It would be achieving nothing. So I just, uh, for all the en I just introduced a uh, sort of an artificial constitutive model for all the engineers in the crowd, this is just kind of like a deviatoric linear elastic one where I choose my uh, shear modulus to be kind of indicative of like my stress strain curve. So sort of the easy listening version of this is I just go, well, I just pretend that my hourglass strains fall along these black lines where the actual material is following the blue one, except generalized to the full 3D. And of course, uh, believe it or not, these are actually the same simulation at the same point in time, the top one without the hourglass control and the bottom one with it. So hopefully that convinces you that that was a worthwhile exercise. And the end result of all that is a usable solver. So I don't really want to talk too much here except to say, oh, look, the thinning profiles kind of match. They look nice. Yeah. Uh, so that seems like a whole bunch of hassle to go through solving these equations. So it's just kind of like, why would I go through all of this when there are other methods available? And in short, it's just that FEA is very general and can accommodate a whole bunch of different complex loading conditions. Uh, sort of the examples I've given here are a slight modification to the formulation I've given you, but it's the same basic stuff to show that we can, sort of, that we can solve uh, really important problems in the stability of structures that come up all the time so for those that are interested, uh, here's just the first and the second buckling modes and the first and the tenth vibration modes, which I can put, which uh, I can calculate using the same code for, let's say, an almost arbitrary mesh as long as I can like uh, discretize it into hexahedral elements. All right, big considerations with FEA. Uh, and this is actually, uh, serious bunch of considerations, which is that uh, while, I've simultane while I've said that it is extremely general, uh, I'm going to simultaneously tell you that one has to be very specific about how one actually uses FEA to solve a problem. Uh, and I've kind of rolled this up into operator expertise can play a really big role in determining whether I get a usable solution and how long it takes me to actually get that solution. So uh, in particular, as I said before, the locking modes of an element are attached to both the element as well as the type of deformation that the element's undergoing. So if I can know in advance that an element isn't, undergo, isn't gonna undergo a particular type of locking, I can get away with a cheaper formulation. Uh, yeah, and then of course there's things like I can use simpler material models in some cases without actually changing the solution so much. And then the one that really surprised me actually is uh, for explicit analysis, so just think time-stepping analysis, uh, I, can pro I can scale the mass and the process time up to, a up to a degree and still get a reasonably good solution. And the way I like to think about this is it's kind of saying, um, if I change the Reynolds number, I still get the right answer, which is, I know, questionable, but it does work. So now I'm gonna move on to isogeometric analysis. 
Now, this was work done by a sponsored PhD, as Michael mentioned, uh, soon to be Dr. Yara Hockinen from the University of Queensland. And the basic idea behind ice geometric analysis is I go through uh, the exact same finite element formulation, except now instead of using these, say, linear basis functions or let's say tensor products of linear basis functions, I use uh, NURBS. So in particular here, I've just sort of gone, well, we can move from our linear FEM. It's different from our quadratic FEM because now our basis functions aren't really limited to individual chunks, they smear out. Uh, engineers really like this because this is, the, uh, this is how they analytically describe the geometry they work with. Uh, I really like this because it has uh, really big implications for the stability of the, uh, of the method. Uh, you can get away with larger time steps and it actually gives a nice smooth everywhere differentiable, of course, depending on which NURBS we choose. Uh, solution to the whole problem. So uh, Yarrow in particular looked at this shell model. So the idea here was that I want to model my uh, shell as the mid surface plus a scaled vector, which I've called D, usually called the director vector. Uh, then I just, with that, jam in all the finite element stuff I did. I end up with a massive mess, but fortunately I get out a similar sort of system, a sort of F equals MA system, we're here now, the A corresponds to the uh, accelerations of the different terms in my geometry definition. I don't really want to go through that because that'll take ages. Uh, now, IGA suffers from many of the same issues FEA does. Uh, when I use FEA, I mean, say, standard FEA, uh, except now they're compounded by both the complexity of the shape functions as well as the additional freedom that I have in defining my geometry. So uh, in particular, if you think about things like the hourglassing is probably the easiest one to think about. In order for an hourglass mode to propagate through a mesh, the neighboring elements have to be able to deform in a similar fashion without absorbing energy. Otherwise, it will just resist the hourglass, the hourglass deformation of like its neighboring elements. Unfortunately, now the concept of element is really smeared out. So when you think about how these things actually have to conform to each other, it becomes significantly more complex. The same goes for things like locking. Uh, determining modes of locking is actually really, really difficult. And uh, so what I'm going to talk about, just for another couple more slides in sort of FEA, is, uh, in sort of IGA, is sort of different uh, integration schemes that people have looked at. At the moment, these are mostly done just by uh, let's say, educated guess, and then we just check whether they work. Um, this has obvious problems, but we, we do what we can. All right, so I'm going to show here uh, three different integration schemes. Uh, I'm going to show here on the, your right, excellent. On the top, this is going to be the displacement of a cantilevered beam as I change a lot, like change how much load I put on the end as a, as a line load. And on the bottom, I'm going to show convergence rates for a, uh, for a simply supported plate with a uniform pressure applied to the top. Fortunately, both of, these, uh, both of these problems have analytic solutions, so I can compare to my analytic solutions, which is nice. So the first, uh, the first scheme I'm going to show you is, looks like this. The basic idea here was to say, well, if I over-integrate the boundaries, that'll stop my hourglass modes from propagating because the boundaries will like will uh, resist it. As you can see, when, we, when Yarrow, I should say, applied this to an actual forming problem, you can see clear signs of hourglassing here. That's that kind of checkered sort of mess you get in there. Uh, the other one he looked at was uh, a scheme that looks like this. Uh, and this one I sort of picked because it sort of demonstrates the problems where you're trying to talk about, well, do I have hourglassing or do I have locking? It's very difficult to actually discern that looking at the solution that you've got there. Like, you've got these waves, but who, who, who knows? And the last one, of course, are the good old Gauss 2 by 2. It actually works extraordinarily well. Uh, it converges very nicely, but the unfortunate thing is that each of these integration points, that actually corresponds to a stack of integration points, and it's there that I have to calculate my constitutive model, and that's actually the most expensive part of each time step. So uh, sort of after all that, I uh, showed you some things that don't look so great, and I really want to show off uh, how good the IGA solver is. In particular, uh, 
just how nice and smooth the solutions you get out, which is my, my favorite part, actually. So uh, here's a simulation. I'm just going to let it run. Shown here in the colors are the uh, thickness. It's being updated as the simulation goes. Don't worry too much about the numbers. Just uh, enjoy how beautiful that solution is. Unfortunately, I've looked at too many linear FEA solutions, which are just not smooth like that. And it's beautiful. Oh, yeah, and I should say this is for a two-point uh, ISF problem. Yeah, excellent. All right, and that's the basics-ish of how we actually do our numerical modeling for these sheet metal forming processes. I'm now going to hand it over to Yung Peng Zhang, Dr. Yungpeng Zhang to talk about the big black box, which I didn't, which is how we actually perform our how our constituent models actually work. So, Dr. Yungpeng Zhang. Thanks, Andrew, for his fabulous talk. And firstly, I want to thank Michael's ex wonderful explanation about why we need the numerical simulation. And also, thanks, Andrew, about his thorough speech about why and how we can apply the metric methods to solve partial differential equation. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the computational material modeling. Um, I apologize because I have a engineering background, so you will see that my slides is not that messy, but I hope you can still understand. Mm -hmm. So material modeling is very important for all sorts of numerical simulations. We saw proper science material models, we will never know whether the result we get is makes sense or not. Um, before we go any further, let's consider a very simple example. Let's say we have an object, and we apply low on the object, and that object will deform. And usually that deformation can be classified of either elastic or plastic. Elastic deformation means that portion of deformation can be recovered once the apparel has been removed. And the plastic deformation means a permanent deformation, which will always stay here, even you have removed both. The elastic deformation is due to the stretch of the item bonds, but without breaking any bond. And the plastic deformation is due to the accumulation of grain dislocation involved, like breaking a limit number of item bonds. For sheet metal simulations, it's very important to not only simulate the elastic deformation, but also the plastic deformation accurately. Because the final shape of the foam part, and there are sort of problems such as like orange peel, earring, and spring beds, which we will find in the actual foam process, are all related to the plastic deformation. So how can we like model the material elastic and plastic deformation? For elastic bit, usually people just introduce a scale function called the energy density function. And we can relate the total stress and the elastic strain by using some uh, material module. Mm, if we, for most simple case, just based on the Hooke's law, like to construct those material modules. And, but for the plastic deformation, since it becomes a bit more compli com complex, so firstly, we have to define when the plastic deformation will happen. In order to do that, people introduce a scale function called the year function. And the year function takes the stress tensor and other auxiliary tensor as input and return a scalar value called, normally called the yield stress. If the yield stress is less than zero, it indicates an elastic domain where only elastic deformation will happen. But when the yield stress is equal to zero and it defines a hypersurface in a high dimensional stress surface, and that surface you should call the yield surface. Only when the stress stays on top of the yield surface, the plastic deformation will happen. 
uh, for a very simple example, if we consider perfect plasticity, uh, as I tried before, misses your criteria, the your surface looks like a cylinder in the three-dimensional principal stress space and looks like an E-piece in the two-dimensional principal stress space and two points in one-dimensional uh, principal stress space. Now we have defined the threshold of the plastic deformation, but we also need to know the evolution of the plastic strains. Um, in order to do that, we have to introduce some flow rules for plasticity deformation. And for, do, for doing that, like people I assume another scale function is called a potential function. So then using the derivative of the potential function with respect to the strain, then we assume the direction of the plasticity strain. Oh, sorry, it's the pro, um, potential function with respect to the stress. Um, for ductile material, like for most of the metal, and it's okay to just assume the potential function is equal to the year function. In that case, we say a uh, associate rule is applied. Mm, if the associate rule is used, then we will easily find that the direction of the plasticity strain is just the norm of the year surface. But for other material like soil, mm, then normally we have to use some no associate rule. Then now we have defined the direction of the plasticity strain, but we also need to define the increment, like the magnitude of increment of the plasticity strain. In order to do that, people assume another condition called the consistent condition, which is the change of the uh, yield function is equal to zero. And by using that assumption and use the assumption of the additive decomposition of the total string, then we can end up with a bottom expression to explicitly derive the uh, magnitude of the plasticity string. And usually people call this is a plasticity multiplier. For other state var uh, for other material state variable can all be written as a function of the plasticity multiplier. So once we have derived the plasticity multiplier, then we can update other state var uh, other state variable according to this. So all material behavior we observe Mm, can be a, re, uh, a result of the macrostructure evolution. And the macrostructure evolution is a result of the, actually is a result of atom interaction. So material modeling is indeed a multi-scale problem. Uh, in this talk, I will just like briefly talk about four very important material behavior for the ship metal forming process. They are uh, as a choppy hardening due to the growth of the metal, uh, the growth of the grain, and then the and so choppy plasticity due to the no uniform grain distribution, and kinematic hardening due to the redistribution of the grain dislocation caused by the secondary loading, and lastly is the ductile damage is caused by the nickelation of the walls. Now people. Yeah, just assume, like define the isotropy hardening as the, just the increased size of the yield surface, but no change the shape of the yield surface. Hence, it's very convenient just to define the yield function as a, fun, as a uh, one stress function and a hardening function. The stress function define the shape of the yield surface, and the hardening function define the growth of size of the yield function. To calibrate the material isotropy hardening, we have to perform some standard experiment tests like the unit axial tension test. Mm. By doing, by cutting a, couple, uh, a coupon from a row sheet and putting the screen, uh, a specimen, apply some loads, and then we can measure the loading and the displacement relationship. And then we can convert the loading and displacement uh, curves 
into the flow stress and effective plasticity stress curve. And using that, we can calibrate our uh, isotropy hardening, which is just the hardening function H. Um, after we have defined the growth of the yield surface, we may also need to define the shape of the yield surface. Because for most of the like road sheet involved in the forming process, the grand distribution is no longer uniform. And they have some preferred direction. The result is like when we perform the standard unit axial tension test for the coupon cut in different direction with respect to the rolling direction, you'll end up with different stress and strain curve. Then we have to introduce some uh, high dimensional like unit polynomial function to generate a reasonable accuracy of the yield surface mm, for the anisotropy material. So um, there are plenty of anisotropy plasticity uh, yield criteria is in the literature, but in general, more accurate yield criteria, which means uh, more computational times. Then, for the material kinematic hardening, we may need to introduce some either translation or distortion of the yield surface. So material kinematic hardening is due to the redistribution of the grand dislocation caused by the cyclic loading. Uh, we can just perform some standard reverse shearing or tension compression test to gather some experiment data to calibrate the material kinematic hardening model. The result show here that so both concepts can accurately model the material kinematic hardening well. So one is by translating the yield surface by introducing some best stress tensor. Another one is by distort, properly distort the yield surface by using some uh, called the macrostructure deviator tensor. But again, more accurate kinematic hardening model means more computation cost. Finally, is the material ductile damage. So there are two most common ductile damage models uh, has been widely applied these days. One is called the Lamentary um, ductile damage model, which is directly model the degradation of the material elastic module. When the elastic module go down to zero, then we say there's macro crack happen. And the other approach is called the Gerson type ductile damage model which is directly model the material macro world growth. So it model the damage of material in four stages. Firstly, is the nucleation of the macro world, and then the world will grow. Eventually, they will connect and finally form the macro crack. And both this ductile uh, damage model will result in a softening behavior in material, which can be represented as a string of the yield surface. And uh, this damage model can be calibrated by compare the correct initiation from experiment data to the predict correct initiation in the simulation. Here I just show some result and explain why we need to adopt the proper material model in a ship metal simulation. Here is just a simple deep joint test. Mm -hmm. So we are just try to simulate a DCO4 steel, which has been tested as a has very high material and SLTP behavior. So the result at the top line is from the Momesis SLTP criteria, which you can see is put what some very inaccurate signals uh, distribution. And this will result in um, extra iteration 
and waste as well as cost in the manufacturing process. So just click right up for this material modeling top. So all the material modeling so far are based on very big assumption, which is we can model the uh, year surface growth and the shape of the year surface evolution separately. This assumption is purely empirical, and people just use that for the sake of simplicity. Um, in reality, the evolution of your surface is a highly nonlinear problem. In order to get a more accurate and uniform material model, we need to consider the macro, uh, the multi-scale behavior in the material. But I won't like continue this topic here. For so if you are interested, please feel free to discuss with me after talk. Thank you very much for your listening. Now I will hand over to Michael to give a final conclusion. Thank you, Young Peng, for that. Okay, um, thank you to all of you in the audience um, for sticking with us through the presentation. I guess to sum up, tonight you've seen uh, hopefully some motivations of why you would want to do simulation of a manufacturing process. Um, you've seen some of the issues that you can have in the numerics and difficulties of getting a, a fast and accurate solver, uh, and also, also some of the advantages of GPU computing. Um, and I think in, in the last section, uh, hopefully you've, you've seen a little bit of the complexity of the material modeling side of things. And also uh, remember that the, um, there are some opportunities out there um, in terms of the outreach programs from Boeing, so please look that up after the talk. And uh, finally, just like to acknowledge um, the support of the Queensland Department of Science, Information Technology and Innovation, BRT, uh, the University of Queensland, QMI Solutions, uh, Boeing in general, and of course, AMSI and uh, QUT um, and Ian for inviting us to do this uh, public lecture tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and I think everyone will agree with me that that was a fascinating look at the sheet metal manufacturing process from a simulation point of view. Okay, so I'd just like to say uh, thank you to everyone from the Numerical Simulation in Materials and Manufacturing Group tonight. So, Mr. Michael Alford, Dr. Andrew Stefan, and Dr. Yu Pang Zhang, and we have a very small gift uh, for you as well. So. Um, Thanks very much um, for covering all those uh, sections in your talk tonight. And if anyone's got any more specific questions they didn't want to ask in front of the crowd, um, Thanks very we'll much. be having some refreshments uh, just outside afterwards and you're welcome to um, ask some more questions to these guys individually. So thank you very much and thank you for coming this evening. <laughs>